This is Hannibal here from TheHannibalTV.com, and today I have a UFO-related interview. I'll put this gentleman's book up right now. He has a new book out called UFO Investigation, The Age of Disclosure. His name is Richard Lang. I'll tell you some of his credentials as far as a ufologist. He is a FAA-licensed commercial pilot with an instrument multi-engine rating. He has a Bachelor of Science degree of aeronautical studies. He had a career for 20 years as a senior vice president working in the trust and investment division of commercial banks. He left the banking career to work as a special deputy with the U.S. Marshal Service post 9-11 with the Department of U.S. Homeland Security as a federal liaison, interfacing with airlines and airport authorities. He was also an anti-terrorist -ter advisory council board member and served as a key speaker on ter terrorism. He was also a lead investigator on the Discovery Channel's TV series, UFOs Over Earth. He managed the uh, MUFON slash Bass project and STAR teams, which at the time was the most advanced funded rapid response UFO investigation team in the world. And in 2012, 2013, he was featured as the lead investigator on the Discovery Channel Canada's TV series, Close Encounters, Season one, season two, and he is the owner of Lang Publishing. Richard Lang, I've been trying to get you on for a few months now. Thank you for finally doing this. Thank you. It's good to talk to you. You've been very busy. You just put out this new book, UFO Investigation, The Age of Disclosure, and you have other books. So maybe just before we get into your career, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about this new book that you have out. Well, this book, um, we just recently published it. I had published a book earlier about um, UFO investigation, and it was primarily designed for like advanced training for investigators and people that have been doing research for a long time. The second book uh, was geared more towards the general public. There's a lot less technical information there, and there's a lot more general information about historical events that have occurred and things that are going on right now in Congress as far as the, the whole... Um, concept of disclosure is concerned. So this book was basically written for the general public, people that may be interested in UFOs, but really don't know a lot about it and want to learn about it. That's, that's was the, the, uh, intention for, for building this book. So you have quite a history as we just went over some of it. How did you go from working in the banking industry to now being, uh, involved in UFO research? Well, it's kind of the other way around. Um, I, um, as you indicated, I've got a degree in aeronautics from Embry Riddle in, in in Daytona, and when I was young, um, I was in flight school and I was flying up the coast of Florida one night by myself in a small single engine airplane, and I basically got in the middle of a, a UFO encounter with uh, an airliner and a private jet, and um, you know, at that point, I realized that this stuff's what's really going on, and and that's what attracted my interest. So it's been a kind of a lifelong thing for me over the last 30, 40 years. Um, career wise, I, I worked in the financial service industry most of my life and being in the bank to trust department, I had a very good high paying job that got me a lot of vacation time. I got six, seven weeks vacation a year and, and I had the money where I could go and basically pursue my interest. So I was working in the, in the bank, but you know, all my spare time went to, to working on this, this research and interviewing people and um, being involved in, with cases of people that uh, had close encounters and that kind of thing, if that makes sense. So basically the bank paid for my research. So was that research you were doing kind of just research for you as an individual for your books or at that point, were you already working with one of the UFO uh firms that actually formally research this stuff and have government contracts to research this? 
Yes. Um, essentially, what I did is um, I had belonged to an organization called MUFON. Most people have heard of it. It's the largest UFO research organization in the world. Um, I essentially um, joined them uh, back in the, the 80s. And um, essentially, um, I got certified as an investigator and I started working on cases th through them. And, um, you know, that's basically how I started. Uh, ended up being the um, the chief investigator for MUFON in North Carolina and Virginia, both. And um, at that point, um, in in the the like in the '90s, MUFON had created this group called the Star Team, and there was only about eight or ten people involved in it. And we were like the the you know the really sh elite, highly experienced investigators were on this team, and I ended up being like the manager for that team. So that's how. Um, that's how we got involved with the discovery channel shows. Essentially we were working on some really high profile cases and, um, the discovery channel had contacted us and wanted to do some, uh, shows about, about UFO cases. So they actually used some of our case material that, that we had done investigations on. And that's kind of how I got going. Was it you that reached out to MUFON or did, did they uh, see some of your materials and reach out to you about starting to work with them? Well, essentially what had happened is Discovery Channel had contacted MUFON and, and you know, they, they basically expressed the desire to, to, to work, to, to, to do some case, to, to do some shows on cases. And so that's, then they got us involved and, um, it was actually Discovery Channel, a producer team that, that contacted MUFON originally to get that, get that all facilitated. And you've also uh, given lectures and so forth on actual how people can properly you, uh, investigate UFOs. Uh, what is a typical UFO investigation like for you? What are, what are some of the steps that you take in these cases? I know they can vary greatly. Well, essentially what, what I did in, in my first book is I put together like a protocol. It, the first book is basically a how to investigate cases. So essentially most of these cases originate on, on databases. The two biggest ones that I know of in the world are MUFON's case management system. And then also the national UFO reporting center. And essentially what they are is like, if you see something or you see a UFO or you have an experience and you want to report it, you go on the website, you go to move on, you go to the UF, national UFO reporting center, and it'll say, you know, click the button, report the case. And when you do that, a form opens up in there and it asks you all kinds of information about the case, what happened, when it happened, how it happened, how you experienced it, what you were feeling, da, 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 all that kind of stuff. And you can also attach photographs and, and video and, and any documents you want to, to that case report. So once that's done, then the case gets assigned to an investigator An investigator obviously reviews all the information in the case and then goes out and, and uh, interviews the person. And, and some of that is, um, you know, some of that stuff is, is part of that process is to sort through some of the scammers because some people put stuff up on that's just, just false and, and they're doing it for attention or whatever. So, you know, a lot of times people report cases and then investigators go out and realize that, 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 that what they were saying really wasn't what happened. The other thing is that probably 85% of those cases that we send somebody out to work on, we'll find some rational explanation for it. You know, um, it could be the, you know, somebody saw something in the sky. Well, you know, for a long time, the, the, the space station at night, you could see it when it was in the night sky, in a clear night sky. Um, and sometimes people will see things. And then when investigators look at it, it could be an unusual formation of planets that, that are just in, you know, at certain times, Jupiter and Saturn can come together and, and makes this, this huge display in the sky, which is really creepy looking, but, um, it, it's explainable 10 to 15% of the time though. Some of those cases have, have really serious merit and essentially, um, they, um, they, they, they're things that happen that, that are, are not explained by rational physics types things. And, and another thing I was going to tell you too, is as far as my career goes, probably the most outstanding thing I've done is, um, it, well, you mentioned that in, um, 2009, um, the Bigelow aerospace, uh, it, it's Bigelow aerospace applied space sciences which is a, a sister company for Bigelow Aerospace, basically went to MUFON and worked out a deal 
to share information. And so essentially what they were doing is they wanted to take a look at these case reports that were coming in. And at that time, MUFON, we're getting 800 case reports coming in every month. So what we did is we put together a team of people. These, this was all paid. Everybody was paid, including me. And we had a group of people, we called them dispatchers. And um, essentially what they would do is they would go through this database every night when, or day when the cases came in. They would review them for accuracy and content and that kind of thing. And, you know, you get 800 cases a month, okay? And, and a case report could any, be anything from, you know, a, a 76-year-old grandfather sitting out on the back porch and saw a light in the sky. Or it could be um, an airline pilot had a close encounter with something that was twice as big as his airplane in his flight path. So obviously you're going to want to work on the case with the airline pilot. So essentially what we did is went through all those cases and out of 80, 800 cases a month, they probably come up with about 40 or 50 of them that were really good cases. And then once we got that far, then I would actually deploy. I ran the program and I deploy investigators to go out and, and, and meet with these people, investigate the cases. And then we'd, we'd write case reports and, and send them back to Bass, which it, we didn't realize at the time, but, but they were basically being funded by the, 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 the um, ATIP program through the, the Pentagon, the Defense Intelligence Agency. Did that sort of answer what you were asking me? Yeah, and I was uh, actually just going to ask you about Bigelow Aerospace because obviously Robert Bigelow, for anyone that doesn't know, uh, he's an extremely rich man. He was from the hotel industry. He started doing this research himself. And I guess now he's developing, from what I understand, like s space hotels type things but also uh, he's continuing to research UFOs and he had the actual government contracts to research UFOs for a while as well as uh, Skinwalker Ranch. So I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about Bigelow Aerospace a little bit more for people who aren't familiar with it. Sure. So, so Bigelow Aerospace is, is, a, is um, a, it's a government contractor, a defense contractor, it's out in the, in, in Las Vegas. And, um, they have a huge facility there, including an underground facility where they, they do research and in Bigelow aerospace, basically th their thing was building modules for space, like deploying, you know, modules where they would inflate and open up and they'd be like living quarters for, for astronauts and things like that. But on be, kind of behind the scenes, they had, done some contract work with the defense intelligence agency and, and, and funding was provided to do this UFO research. The funding came, um, it, it was, it was through Congress with, with Harry Reid, of course, was the person that pushed it. And, um, at that point, um, uh, they, they organized this group called Bass, which was, you know, Bigelow applied space sciences, which was like a sister company. And, um, Essentially, I worked with them through MUFON when I ran that project for a year. So that's kind of how the, the thing worked. Now, excuse me, at the same time, Bigelow also owned the Skinwalker Ranch. And um, there was research that I believe was going on out there the whole time, too. And it's, it's a pretty, um, it's an incredibly interesting place. Um, uh, George Knapp and Colm Callahan wrote a book called In Search of the Skinwalker. Um, it, it, it's just unbelievable the, the phenomena that's happened there. Actually, I did not read that book until after I worked with those guys. And if I didn't know them as well as I did, I wanted to believe the book. That's how, how wild it is. But I'm quite sure everything in there is true. It's an amazing story. And, and now there's some TV series about it too. The, the ranch was sold um, and, and, and they're running some, um, they're, they're um, running some, um, uh, uh, TV series about what's going on out there. It's quite interesting. Now, one thing about the Skinwalker Ranch is it seems that UFO activity is connected to paranormal activity there. Have you noticed through your research that there is a connection with paranormal and UFO activity as well? Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the, a, you know, a, a couple of years ago, I was invited to speak at the National Paranormal Coalition, and um, um, 
th- th- I was there for a couple three days and, and, and there was a lot of different individuals there that a lot of people that do like, um, uh, ghost, you know, ghost hunting type stuff and write books about ghosts and things like that were there. And one of the things I learned was a lot of that phenomena. There's some very similar, there's some big similarities between some of that stuff. I mean, if you think about it, you know, some of the old ghost stories from back in the 1800s, and then you compare some of the uh, abduction reports that people talk about now, you know, they might have been not really been ghosts. They might have been ETs. We, we just don't know, but there, there's definitely some, um, uh, strange phenomena that occurs in a lot of these cases. In the first book, I tried to convey that there's several chapters in the book about um, high strangeness. And um, what I talk about is your perception of reality. And one of the things I think that happens to someone over the years, when you do this kind of research, you know, you go out and you talk to people that have had abduction experiences. I can remember early about this stuff. I'd be like, God, this is impossible, you know. And, and I'd be driving home and thinking, man, I just want to get out of here and, and go home, you know. And then you go interview another one and another one and another one. And after about about five or six years, you start going, wait a second, these guys are all, none of, they don't know each other. They're not connected in any way, but they're all telling you the same details, which makes me realize that what they're telling you is, is real. And if that's true, then a lot of the stuff I learned in physics in college is, is not the way we think it is, if that makes sense. Definitely. Carlos is wondering what you could tell us about what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch from your own research. Well, let me just say, first of all, I've not ever been to the Skinwalker Ranch. I was working on that project. And um, at the same time, some of the guys at, at, at Bigelow were, were, were out there on the ranch. I'm, I'm pretty sure that was happening. But essentially, um, if what, what it amounts to is there's just some very, very strange paranormal things that happen there. I think that probably it's like a interdimensional portal and, and, uh, you know, I, I, I can't really explain it other than to say that, you know, there, there's things that happen there, those portals open and, and there's some kind of a pathway to another dimensional reality outside ours. And there's just some very weird stuff that happened there. And, and I think going forward, I mean, there's still, um, they're, you know, with, with the TV show and everything out there, they're still looking at that stuff. And, um, it, it, what, I, what I can tell you is, is if you read that book that, that, uh, George Knapp and Colin Kelleher wrote, it, it's just incredible. It, they've got extremely high detail in there, what happened and how it happened. And it's just, just really, really interesting. What would your theory be about why all that activity is happening there? We've we've heard a lot of theories that that might be there might be like a interdimensional blip or something, some sort of portal right. for that area. But I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. Well, in in the book, I try to distinguish that a little bit too because the 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 when we talk about interdimensional portals, those are there's typically some high strangeness activity, but it's associated with a place as opposed to a UFO abduction where um, there's a craft of some kind, either on the ground or hovering near where the person's abducted. So, so the interdimensional portals are somehow associated with a place, a geometric location. And I I would think that there's a lot more of them than we probably realize. Um, Some of the research that's being done in the national parks, like people just disappearing, it's unbelievable. Like thousands of people, you know, in, in some of these national parks, they just disappear without a trace. And it's interesting that some of the research, and I'm not an expert in that area. I just, just, just find it fascinating, but you know, basically these, this happens in certain areas where, you know, a woman will disappear. And then five years later, another guy will disappear in the, in the, within, you know, the thousand yards of, of where the first one did that kind of thing. So there's something there. I just don't completely understand it either. Rob Alexander is wondering what has been your closest encounter with a UFO? Does it, he means personally with me. Um, again, I'm an investigator. And, and so, you know, I don't really, m- m- my claim to fame is not having been um, in, involved in that many close encounters. But um, essentially, when I was young, I was flying up the coast in Florida. And um, I heard these airline pilots contacting the air traffic controllers. 
and um, they, I was, I was out over the, the, the ocean where I could still see the beach and the lights. It's a beautiful, it's a stunning ride to go up there at night, about two or 3000 feet flying up there. And I am listening to radio traffic. And so um, I'm listening to these pilots talking and usually you've got two radios, one radio is tuned to where you just came from and the other radio is tuned to the next place you're going. So you're listening to two radios. So I'm hearing these pilots talking and this pilot calls in and he said, I've got traffic in my flight path. And he's talking to an air traffic controller. Air traffic controller comes back, goes ne negative radar contact, no, no, you know. So a few minutes later, the pilot calls back again. He goes, look, we have traffic. We have visual, which means they can see it, in our, of, a, of an object in our flight path. And, and the controller comes back, oh, negative radar contact, you know. And, and, and at this point, you could tell the, the guy's getting ticked off. And he goes, look, there's something huge, unconventional, hovering over the ocean slowly rotating with multicolored lights on it and then uh, uh then it gets quiet for a minute and then another pilot from a, a, a business jet calls in and says uh we have a visual on the same object as eastern does you know and in the in the pot and the traffic controllers kept saying negative radar contract they wouldn't admit that they could see it so my job basically that night my flight i was going to jacksonville and i was just going to go up land get gas go back and um, so when I get to Jacksonville, which at that time was a um, it was a naval air station. So there was military traffic and, and civilian commercial traffic going in that airport at the same time. So when I called them to land up there, they wouldn't let me land. And they just said, maintain holding. They want me to fly around a circle for departing military traffic. So I'm sitting up there, you know, flying around, looking around. And all of a sudden I see these two fighter jets come screaming off that runway you know, one like right behind the other, a little off to the side. And they went right out over the ocean. You could hear them blowing through the sound barrier. You could see them all lit up in afterburners. And they were going right out to where that object was that those pilots were talking about. So the thing I learned that night was basically the traffic controllers wouldn't acknowledge it was there when they talked to the pilots. But, you know, when they s dispatched two fighter jets out to, to check it out, they knew it was there. They just didn't want to talk about it on the radio. So that was kind of like, my first lesson in ufology carlos just has a follow-up question going back to your uh, skinwalker ranch comment in your opinion he's wondering if it's more paranormal or extraterrestrial a oh, good question um i think that um first of all let's define the parameters okay most people when they say paranormal they're talking about something that's just like strangeness in maybe another dimensional reality or something like that extraterrestrial is, is it's associated with some intelligent life force off planet okay i think sometimes both of those things are in play because um the um the, the in, in, in again in in my first book i talked a lot about the multi-dimensional realities you know time space realities and essentially what we're living in this third dimensional reality but there's other dimensions that simultaneously exist here at the same time we just can't see them because we're not tuned into their their frequency it's almost like if you if you go to your television you turn your tv on you put it on one channel and you can watch that channel and you're tuned into it and you can see and hear everything that's going on there you switch the channel to a different frequency and you can watch the different channel you can see what's going on there both of those channels and all that broadcasting is it exists simultaneously. It's just you can only see the one that, that your your frequencies tuned into. And I think that's you know part of our our dimensional reality is we we operate at a frequency and we're tuned into this third dimensional reality. So when when we get out, you know, there's other forces outside of that reality and things that can disturb that or open that up are like these interdimensional portals where I think people you know you get in these certain areas where the frequencies are skewed where you're in this reality but you can all see something from another reality and um yeah i think that some of the stuff at the skinwalker ranch is it, it, it's probably extraterrestrial only because um aside from the portals that have opened there's been a lot of activity with like um orbs that, that float around there and those are you know orbs are basically these balls of light that fly around and they're intelligently controlled and most people i think would agree that there's some extraterrestrial presence there well there's probably the answer to this question is probably both now this is a bit of a long question but in your opinion, what do you think is going on with UFOs? I know they can't all be categorized the same way because 
there's different types and, and possibly uh, different intentions and and some might be from other places. They all might not be coming from the same places. But overall, in all your years of research, if you had to sum up what's going on, what would be your theory as far as what's going on? Yeah, that's a good, that's a fair question. Um, and, and I have a pretty definitive answer for that. I think that essentially what's happened is that if you look back in, in history, you know, go back a thousand years and you go into some of these pyramids and, in ancient caves, there's all kinds of drawings of pictures of saucers and stuff like that. In my book, but I think that the, the extraterrestrial presence has been here a long time. And I don't think it's just restricted to one group or society. I think that there's a number of these, um, societies, extraterrestrial societies or cultures, whatever you want to call them that, that have visited earth and do visit earth and probably will continue to visit earth. And, and I think that they're there, they have different agendas. I mean, just based alone on the, um, the reports that, you know, when you interview these people and they have encounters, there's a pretty dramatic difference in the, um, the type of entities. There's some of these people, um, there's some of these people that these entities look just like us. If you were sitting there having breakfast somewhere and, and the guy on, uh, across the counter from you, you'd never, if, if he was, you, you'd never know it because he'd look and behave perfectly normal and human. Then there obviously the others, the grays and the ones with the big eyes and the big heads and all that kind of thing. So just based on the fact that, you know, that people see different types of species in, in, in what I see in these reports that they report and literally I've looked at thousands of them and, um, there's different, there's definitely different species. One of the things I think that, um, probably in, in my book, and I talked about this a lot was that, um, I think that you, we, the, the activity UFO activity dramatically increased during the, about the time Truman was president. And I, a lot of people believe, and I'm one of them, that I think that that's back when the United States started doing a lot of atomic testing, detonating atomic bombs, and then ultimately destroying two cities in, in Japan with atomic weapons. It seems that the UFO activity dramatically increased during that time period. And um, yeah, I saw that about Ecclesiastes, yeah. Um, the... Um, the at the same time you know in the world war ii era we had built this really powerful anti-aircraft radar you know to prevent a pearl harbor type of thing well a lot of a lot of us believe that that anti-aircraft radar which is very powerful would disrupt the you know electrogravitic propulsion systems in these saucers and cause them to crash and i listed in my book there's like two pages of them there was more than it. The Roswell is just like the tip of the iceberg. There were dozens of, of these crashes that were recovered all over the world. And, um, you know, the government started to, to really do the, the heavy duty research in it. And, um, you know, that's kind of, you know, where it's at right now. I think that part of this is that we're coming to a point where the government, the Pentagon, they're going to, they've already started to release information about this. So they're changing their st- their, their status on it. You know, up until four years ago, this pretty much was taboo. You know, most radio announcers were afraid to talk about it. Hardly any politicians would talk about it. And, and for the most part, anybody, people like me that go interviews, most of the time they make, they try to make a fool out of you. And, um, and that was just the way the, the American media worked. And, and all of a sudden we're seeing that dramatically change too, because there's something on the horizon, I think, as far as how that's going. I've actually heard Tom DeLong say the same thing, that right. part of the concern that these uh, UFOs might have with nuclear weapons and why we see them over these uh, nuclear silos is because uh, the electromagnetic fields can cause them to crash from these nuclear weapons. And he actually even said that... Uh, some of these weapons that have been tested, so to speak, in space and underwater may actually have been set off to actually do intentionally do some stuff to some UFOs that could have been up there um, by our governments. Uh, did you ever hear anything like that? 
Well, I, I personally don't know Tom DeLong. Um, I've, I've watched some of his videos, of course, but um, I think that um, th that in my research, there's been a number of people, credible people, mil mostly military officers, higher ranking military officers that have worked around nuclear installations. And they're all telling you that these things would hover over that there's, there's cases like out in, in the, the out West where these things will hover over a, a, a missile silo field and just m shut all the nuclear weapons down. And, and everybody's in there in like total amazement. They just hover over there and they do it. And that's happened m m many times. And there's a lot of stuff that happens around nuclear weapons storage facilities, like the same kind of thing. So, yeah, they're definitely, the ETs are definitely interested in that. You know, I don't have any information as far as how maybe the military might be retaliating about that. I, I don't know. I don't know. Now, we also hear uh, various reports like... Um, Dr. Stephen Greer, for instance, will say that they all want to help us and, and some other people such as Paul Hellyer, who I interviewed before he unfortunately passed, and this, uh, this uh, wow. official that came out last year, uh, I believe he was from Israel, about this galactic federation of aliens that supposedly watch over Earth and they're only intentions are to protect us but i've also read other declassified military reports where it seems there has been evidence that there there could have been some some harm to humans over the years due to these various craft and some of these alleged abduction incidents do you think that we can categorize them all as kind of benevolent and they're they're not going to do any harm to us or is there a potential threat since they are in our airspace and as far as we know they're not letting us know who they are but i've also heard you say in an, in another interview that you do believe that there has been some contact with government officials and the government officials just aren't telling us yeah yeah that, that okay let's start with that um First of all, I think, again, is there's multiple species, and um, I believe that some of those species have been in contact with, with, with people in our government for a long time. I remember uh, Edgar Mitchell, who passed before he died. He had given an interview in Europe. I think it was in London somewhere, and um, he'd never do it in the United States and get away with it, or at least it wouldn't get on TV. But um, he made the comment that, you know, we've been in contact with extraterrestrial societies for 60 years and i'm really getting tired of lying about it you know um a lot of the um a lot of the stuff that I, I think here's the underlying thing that makes it more interesting okay and i really think this is what's going on is yes the government has been in contact with some of these these races and i think they've traded technology with them um bottom line is back in the you know and again i went through all this pretty it's a pretty good history lesson of, of how ufos you know, this whole thing emerged in our country in my book, but essentially you've got Truman who's, um, you know, in the, in the atomic bomb age, these are the guys that built the atomic bomb in total secrecy. They start recovering UFOs. They realize all of a sudden that, uh, um, you know, th this, this technology that, that, that makes these things run is really valuable and can be used for military applications like they did with the atomic bomb. So all of a sudden it all of a sudden goes undercover. It gets very secret. Um, there's, um, there's a record that I have of the, the, the Senator from, um, 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 New Mexico had a, a personal meeting with, uh, Truman the day after Roswell crash. And after he met with Truman, he went back and contacted all the broadcasting companies and said, if you print one more word about this UFO story, we're going to pull your broadcasting licenses. So they weren't screwing around and they wanted it quiet and they wanted it right now quiet. And that's what they did. And they've been getting away with it for a long time. So by the time Eisenhower comes along, you know, with this, this material they're recovering in these crashes, um, what they did is they went to these private companies like um, uh, there, there's a dozen, dozens of them. But, but like Bell, just for example, they would take material that they found in a UFO crash. Uh, for example, uh, fiber optic tubing. 
Okay. They gave that stuff to Bell Laboratories and basically made a deal with them and said, you do the, the research, back engineering and the research on this. You can have all the patent rights on it. Um, you can make all the money you want as long as you keep the technology for military industrial applications. And, you know, they went to DuPont and did the same thing. Kelvar was developed from UFO material. Um, all the big microchip companies, IBM, uh, Texas Instruments, there's, there's a half a dozen companies that were involved in that where they got these microchips. And, 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 and if you don't believe any of that, you know, this was all going on back in the early, you know, in the Eisenhower days. If you just look at those companies and, and now they're the multi-billion dollar international corporations of the world, they made a ton of money on this technology. And again, their, their deal was to try to keep it quiet. And that's, that's what they did. So, so you've got th this unbelievable military industrial complex, you know, the one that Eisenhower warned about basically running behind the scenes covertly, pretty much running the world as far as technology goes. And so, you know, we, we had this whole thing that came out last, um, you know, this, this report that was supposed to be generated in, um, June. Essentially, the, the last um, last year uh, before Trump left office, he signed this this big stimulus package. Well, part of the stuff, you know, it was fifty six hundred pages. Well, part of this stuff that was in there, it was approved by Congress. It was a mandate that, um, you know, the intelligence agencies had to, to come forward and tell what they know about UFOs. And so you've got the the the. Um, um, you know, the, the FBI and Navy intelligence and the, um, the, the defense intelligence agency working with the, uh, office of the director of national intelligence. And they're basically under the gun mandated by Congress to come up with a report. And so they did. So on around June 24th, they published a report. Actually, they published two reports. They published one report, which is nine pages that got released to the public. And there was another report that was 70 pages that was released to a handful of congressmen under highly secured, uh, top secret like, uh, meetings and locations. But the fact that that report was coming out, it generated an incredible amount of public interest. And at the same time, what you're seeing with these, um, with, with the disclosure the Pentagon has been making, essentially the Pentagon, you know, there, there's all of a sudden, uh, these, these fighter jet cockpit videos are getting leaked to the to the public to the press in the washington post and the new york times are starting to write articles about them and you know the famous case with the nimitz where they they had the encounter with the tic tacs and the roosevelt and um all this stuff is coming into the public domain and at the same time the pentagon's spokesmen are coming forward and say yep this stuff's real it's absolutely real you know and they won't say where it comes from they say they don't know which is crap but at least they're telling the public that's real. And that's like a can of worms that once you open it, you can't close it up again. So in the last year or so, they've come out with all this stuff. And basically there's, you know, and since then there's been dozens of photographs released by Navy, you know, Naval, there's one that I put in my book and it's basically got the, 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 uh, cockpit camera, those cameras in those, those fighter jets are flurs, they're infrared cameras. So people say you can't really tell what's it's it, it's because it's like an, a heat signature type camera. It works like it's an infrared camera. But there's one picture where the the, the pilot you can see the 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 object on the on the flare on the on the on the image in the cockpit camera, and then he must have had a cell phone or something. He took a picture of it out the out of the window of the cockpit, so you can see a photograph of it and the flare image of it. And the Pentagon comes along, and goes, "Yep, those are real. Those are taken by a naval pilot." So once you start doing that, it, it opens the, it opens the whole thing up and you can't put it back again. And the people that ask why the cell phone picture is blurry, it's because he's flying at extreme speeds. And also there is other other photos that they likely have that just haven't been released to the public because somebody Absolutely. leaked those photos that are well, out there. There well, there's there's hundreds. People say, well, if this is real, how come we don't have any pictures of them? I, I mean, I've seen thousands of pictures of these things. They're out there. But, you know, the, the, the you try to publish one in some paper, will go, oh, this is, you know, it's phony or somebody will they'll get somebody to say it's not it's not real. Up until, you know, and, and I talked about this in the book a little bit, up until the last couple of years, if you do basically here was the rules for TV interviews for UFOs, like what we're doing or maybe on some primetime channel. Here's what they do. 
you have an hour show. And so for the first two thirds of that show, me or whoever it is, I'm on here showing you pictures and talking about what happened and how it happened and giving you all the evidence and everything. Well, the rules were the last 25% of the show has to be done by someone with an adversary view. So what you've got is the last 15 minutes of the show, some guy comes on with a bow tie and a big grin on his face, claiming to have all these scientific credentials. And it basically says that I'm an idiot and everything I said is BS. That's how UF, that's how, that's how USA television shows were always done up until the last couple of years. And my, my experience in Canada was when we were filming up there, um, when we filmed in Canada, it was a completely different environment because they don't, they don't play those games. They were much more interested and much more objective about what we were, we were trying to say. There's someone on here asking your opinion about the Tic Tac video and for the people that are alleged to have de debunked it, the government is still saying that it is a legitimate unidentified aerial phenomenon. There's several of those videos and supposedly those are only small sections of the actual right. full videos. There's actually longer versions that haven't been released from my understanding. Yes, first of all, the, the Tic Tac videos are, um, those are authentic, okay? Um, you know, the DN, the defense intelligence agency and various offices of the Pentagon, they, they, they validated them and verified them there. So here's, here's a short overview of what was going on. You've got the Nimitz and the Roosevelt and they're out in the Pacific ocean, about a hundred miles off the coast of San Diego. And they're doing some maneuvers, doing whatever they do out there, practice maneuvers or just getting ready to, you know, it's a battle group, maybe getting ready to deploy somewhere. So the Roosevelt had very powerful radar. The Roosevelt's a battleship and the, uh, the, um, the Nimitz is a, an aircraft carrier. So the Roosevelt was experiencing the, the guys in their control tower, their air traffic controllers were seeing a lot of activity that was up around 80,000 feet. Now, 80,000 feet is higher than commercial airplanes go and that almost all military planes can't even get that high. That's, that's high. So, um, essentially they're watching this activity at 80,000 feet and their, their, their radar guys are going this something's wrong here. So they went and brought the, the, the tech crews in to recalibrate all their radar because they thought it might be some kind of a malfunction or something. So they completely recalibrate all the radar and set everything up and the, 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 they're still there. Well, then what, what they noticed was they started coming down and now they had activity at like 30,000 feet. That's where commercial airplanes fly. And so what, what happened on, on the, in that event is you've got, um, you've got the, um, the, um, the Nimitz and they had, um, they had launched two jets that were doing training maneuvers. And, um, the, the, the controllers on the Roosevelt contacted those two pilots and asked them both if they were carrying live ordinances, which did they have live weapons? They both said no. And so at that point, the controllers dispatched them or directed them, gave them coordinates to go to a location where they talked about a disturbance in the water. Okay. And so when they got to that area is when Frazier, he was talking about these things are like four, they shape like a Tic Tac for lack of something better to call it. And they're about 40 feet across and they, they're like zooming around at unbelievable speeds. He said one of them came right across his nose at, at, at a speed that was unbelievable and shot right out of sight. Okay. So these things were there. And, and there was also something going on in the water, which they haven't talked about that much, but there was also a huge craft that was submerging down in the water there. Okay. So I know that those, I know that, that, that whole story and those videos are, are authentic and, and th there's, there's m more to that, that I'm, I'm just telling, I'm quite sure that I'm not going to talk about on the air, but I know for a fact that that happened. Right. And again, it wasn't the government that actually initially released those. That was to the stars Academy that somehow right. got a hold of them and released it. And then the government later formally released it. And then even right. later the Pentagon commented on it, confirming that they were UAPs. Well, yeah, essentially what you got TTSA, the Academy of the stars. Um, I did, you know, part of the chronology or the sequence of events that I'm talking about that's leading up to disclosure, I, I did some research on TTSA. And essentially what I believe, and I'm quite sure it is, is that TTSA was really created to um, bring out this information. And, and if you look at it, all the people like Pudoff and 
um, that, that were involved in that are all like highly, um, highly, they're, they're way up high up in the intelligence agencies. And what they did is they got together, they got the long, um, and, um, the, I think part of his deal was they thought that might make it more interesting or palatable to the younger group, which was probably smart to do. But basically they created this group and, and their role was, was to just start disclosing information. And if you look at some of their, the, the, the stuff that they're saying behind the scenes, they, they claim that they were created to do that. And they actually deliberately did disclose the information. They got, they got the leaks. They put the, 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 the fighter jet cockpit pilot videos out in the public. They gave the information to the people that wrote at the Washington Post and the New York times. Um, and, and they were responsible for that. They claimed that they were the ones that, that released that information. And that's what their job was basically. Derek has a question for you. He's wondering what you think of the Gnome, Alaska incident where a psychologist's daughter was abducted allegedly by UFO. If you've I'm, heard. Not, I'm not sure which case he's talking about. Is he talking about the one where it was called the fourth kind or something like that? They made a movie about it. I'm not sure. Yeah. We'll see if he can follow up on that, but let's assume yeah. it was that one. Yeah, there that that was just a that was a, a case that that a psych you know it was a really interesting movie, but essentially a psychologist was involved in a UFO abduction. There was a lot of a lot of like very strange things that happened, and um, the 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 woman ended up in a psychiatric hospital over it. Was was really very sad. Husband committed suicide. It was a really nasty mess. Now you've interviewed a lot of alleged abductees. I've heard you say after all these years of doing it, you can pretty much tell who's doing it for attention and, and who has legitimately had something happen to them. Uh, what do you think about these abduction stories? Well, for the most part, the people that I've been involved with that I've spent any time with, I'm quite sure that what they're saying is true for sure. They believe it's true. Um, the, the thing is that, um, I used to say that I said, I think I articulated it in my first book, but you know, if you go out to interview someone and the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, look, you know, I want to make sure that I get all the patent rights if anything gets written about this. And if we get on Larry King live, I get credit for every, you know, and as soon as they start talking like that, it's like, I know I'm wasting my time and I leave by the same token, you meet somebody. I, I once talked with a member of Congress and the, here's how the conversation went. The guy said, look, my brother and I, we had this experience. It was on our farm and, and I'm going to tell you about it because it freaked me out and I want to talk to somebody about it. But if you ever tell anybody or use my name, I'll deny I ever heard from you. I won't talk about it. And I don't want any public attention. I just want, I'd want to talk to somebody. And, and the guy's like all shook up and scared when he's telling me. So when somebody's like that, then, you know, you're probably going to learn something. You know what I'm saying? Um, most of the people that pr people that, the, these are everyday people. And for the most part, they're honest, hardworking people. You know, some of them have careers, uh, political or, or, um, you know, medical careers, stuff like that. And, and there's no reason for them to lie about any of this. You know, I mean, they don't, they already have everything they want and need and they don't, they don't, you know, they're not going anywhere with it. So usually a lot of that has to do with, with what somebody tells you. And every time, every time you deal with these people, um, you just get a little more insight into what's going on. I would say just going back to what you said about Stephen Greer, I've met Stephen Greer and uh, I think he's a really smart guy and I really, uh, uh, I really admire a lot of the work he's done. And, and of course his thing is, um, you know, in, in general, he's saying that these, these, these entities are, are, are benevolent. And I think for the most part, that's true. And the reason I say that is because they have unbelievable technology that they could have wiped us off the face of the earth anytime they wanted to. And, and the fact that they haven't done it sort of tells you that they're not, you know, if they wanted to hurt us, they'd have already done it by now. That's my theory. So what do you think they are doing when they are uh, doing these abductions? Is it just research? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I think that, I think there's some kind of biological research going on there. And also, you know, it seems like well, and like that's they've been around for a long time. I just published a book for a um, a gentleman, Fran Ridge, who um, 
was out in the Midwest and he published a book about UFO encounters, like in the, in the late seventies, eighties and early nineties. It's really, it's a, it's a really cool book. And, and I got to know him really well, but some of these guys, when you talk to them, it seems like right now things have cooled off a little bit. And by that, I mean, we're not seeing the abduction stories like we used to. Okay. Now, there, there's two schools of thought on this, and one is that the, the abductions are slowing down or they're not doing them anymore, or the government's getting much cleverer and sneakier about covering them up so we don't find out about them. And I'm not sure which one's actually happening. Phil says New England is a hotbed for UFO activity. He mentions the Betty and Barney Hill story and the oldest flying saucer picture was taken in 1897. And Mount Washington, uh, he's wondering if there's any geographic attractions related to UFO sightings. Um, that's a good question. A lot of people ask that. One of the things when we were, when we were running our star team, um, we had um, like this big map that we did. And we had a guy that every t all these really good cases that we, we worked on and that we knew about, we were putting little dots on the map, you know, to try to see if there was any correlation with location. We did that for a couple, three years. Excuse me. And what we found was that in the areas that are they're highly populated is where you get the most UFO reports. For example, out in the in the in the around the desert where there isn't anybody, you don't get any reports. But if you look like you know the interstate corridors going up from Tucson to Phoenix, there's a lot of sightings around there because there's a lot of people and there's a lot of cars there and there's a lot of people moving around in those areas. So what we found, at least from what we concluded, was that. It's not really that uh, they're all over the place, it, but but the sighting reports, remember, you have to have a person there to see it in the, the more highly populated areas seem to get the most reports for, for you know, what that's worth. Now, out in California, there's a lot more reports than there are in, um, you know, in the Sahara Desert somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Uh, of course, just as we talked about the Tic Tac incidents earlier, they were over water. We, we always hear about this connection between UFOs and water. Most of them are able to submerge and operate underwater, unlike uh, vehicles that we have. We don't really have any that are known to operate above water, outside of the atmosphere, and in our atmosphere. What do you think the connection is to UFOs and water? Well, the, the answer to that question is they're transmedian vehicles. I, I touched on that in my book, but a transmedium vehicle means it can go through the air, it can go through water, and sometimes it can break through solid material. There's there's cases where you see pictures of these UFOs like going into a mountainside and it just goes right in, right, you know, it's, it's not a crash, it's just like a rock slipping into the water, it just goes right into there. And the same thing, it's called USOs, un, un, you know, unidentified submerged objects. And the Navy and the Coast Guard have had their share of, of, of encounters with these things. But bottom line is, when you're when you're talking about water and our technology, it's kind of like it's kind of like aerodynamics. You know, it, something can only move through the water so fast because the water has to displace around it. So, for example, a torpedo might be limited to, you know, maybe 45 miles an hour or something like that. So the fastest thing that's going to go underwater is 45, 50 miles an hour at the max. Okay. And these, these guys are tracking this stuff on radar going 300 miles an hour under the water. If that, you know, so that, that they have a technology or the way to, to, to do that, 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 that obviously works. Um, and also the, um, you know, it, with the, the incident with the Tic Tacs in, with the Nimitz and the Roosevelt, there were, there were other reports that um that that i i read that um in in the the people that wrote them are, are not going going to have any public contact don't want any but basically when they went out there there was other pilots involved in that thing with the roosevelt when they went out there um there was essentially something that was submerging into the water and and it was big like maybe couple hundred yards in diameter and they could see that it was going down in. you could see the water foaming up around it and that kind of thing so there was some kind of a, a mothership if you will involved in that they haven't really talked about that much in the public domain now carlos has another good question um if the uh the ufos want to help us like some people have said so much why don't they actually just come forward and help us yeah, that's a good, that's a good question too. And I think that, uh, you know, the answer, my answer would be, they probably already are. And, and, 
by that, I mean, there are a lot of people that, um, in, in, you know, in Greer's group, they call them CE5 encounters where these people basically go out somewhere remotely and they just sit quietly and meditate and they get in contact with some of these, you know, entities. And, and I think some of these people, I think there's people out there that are getting some kind of contact from them in, in learning stuff. You know, most of the people that have these kind of encounters, it's, 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 it's things that are, they're talking about futuristic things. And, you know, a lot of concern about the damage to the planet, obviously with nuclear weapons and, um, you know, the in, industrial control of things and that kind of stuff. But I think they probably have. And, you know, if you, if you really want to get into it and I haven't really done that yet, but, um, is to go to uh, some of these places like, um, the Monroe Institute, which was basically was a psychic research center. And now they do a lot of really awesome public classes. And, and, you know, when you essentially to find your answer, you got to get out of this, you know, the nuts and bolts type thinking, if that makes sense. Um, I I remember reading something where Tesla said that when science starts to study the non-physical aspects of some of this stuff, in, in a very short period of years, they'll advance like a thousand years in, in, in technology, you know? So the way, the way to learn more about that is probably to, to do some of these things where people can look at, um, you know, the, the out of body experiences and the deep meditation and stuff like that to learn more about themselves and their, their, their spiritual, their, their, their consciousness. Pubert would like to know, what your thoughts are on the MJ 12 documents. If are they real in your opinion? You froze up here for a second. Okay. Huber, yeah, I, like it. I see it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I talked about this at length in, in my book and part of the history of UFOs, particularly in the Truman administration, um, the, 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 the majestic 12 group was created by Truman and, and, um, forestall. And um, essentially what they they did was they created a group of people. There were some military people, government people, and half of them, to my surprise, when I did the research, came from the Commission on Foreign Relations, which is still a very powerful group, global group that, that you know, um, it's an American think type type group. But but the, but the who's who of, of everybody and anybody that's involved in in money and power and government, it belongs to it. And um, half the people that um, were a part of the original MJ-12 group were were from the Commission on Foreign Relations. I've got about a half a chapter talking about how that all came up and how it was, uh, how it how it happened. But it's that, yeah, that that's for sure. And it still goes on today too. I mean, it, uh, you know, I'm sure there's that there's a, a very small group that that have a lot of control about what what's going on with the government and so forth. But again, um, that that you know when I when I was talking to George and we were talking about the the whole thing with disclosure again it's it's a two pronged thing because the what the government knows about this stuff is you know back in the 60s they farmed a lot of this technology out to these these multinational defense contractors and now they're the ones that have control of the of, of the technology and in in the information um about what what's really going on. So at some point the government's going to say, yeah, here, here's what we know about it. And, and, and maybe they, there's an, a lot they don't know because, you know, IBM and Bell Laboratories and a dozen other companies have all this secret technology they've developed and they're not going to hand it over as long as they don't have to, you know, um, I remember, um, and again, this was in England the, the, in, in, and I, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but the guy that was CEO for, uh, IBM had retired. It was about seven or eight years ago. And he did a speech that was televised. And basically he came out and said that, you know, the original micro te- microchip technology that was developed from wreckage that was recovered from extraterrestrial spacecraft. I mean, he just came around and said that, you know, that again, if you did that, in, if you did that in, um, in the United States, they wouldn't put it on TV. They might now, but they wouldn't have then. And Elon Musk uh, last year put out a tweet saying that uh, the pyramids were created by aliens. It was kind of tongue in cheek, but with him trying to work on the project of colonizing Mars, he would be privy to, to more information from the government than your average person. You would, you would think. Well, um, you know, that 
and you don't have to have privy information from the government. All you got to do is if you look at the technology that went into building the great pyramids in, in, in Giza, um, the, those, uh, you know, there was a documentary a few years ago and, and, and this, this industrial company that does like has these huge cranes and stuff. And th those stones, some of those stones are a hundred tons. We don't have a crane that can pick up a hundred ton stone. There is no such thing on this planet. Not that big. And then when you look at these stones, they're cut so precisely that you can't stick a razor blade in the crack between the two stones. Now, how'd they do that back then? We couldn't even hardly do that now. You know, you're talking about something cut with a laser and, you know, some real high technology stuff. And not to mention then, how did you move the stone from the quarry, which was 12 miles away to where the pyramids built? 100 ton stone. And no, they didn't put it on mud and slide it and roll it around on logs. That's complete crap. So somebody else was involved in it. Now, Carlos is asking where people can order your book. I did put the link to his book in the description, but maybe you could take this time now to tell us about the books you have out and anyone that wants to order it. The direct Amazon link is in the description of this video. And I'll also pin it to the top of the comments after this interview is over. Yeah, thank you. Essentially, um, if you go onto Amazon, if you just type in UFO investigation in my name, the book will come up. All the books are linked together. So it, 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 whichever book you pull up, you'll see the other books listed right underneath them, like as a series. And um, a lot of the, um, just as, as an update, a lot of the, the, the comments that I've gotten about the two books, the first book was basically more technical design for people that investigate UFO cases that are like, like, advanced training and advanced training for researchers. And there's a lot of technological stuff in there about equipment that's used and how to set the, you know, the, the lenses and all that kind of thing. And the second book is written more for public disclosure about, about, about what's, what I think is going to happen in the next couple of years, as far as getting closer and closer to the full disclosure thing. Now I've got like a sequence or a stairway of what I think is going to happen. Um, also, we're working on a third book. I think I mentioned that basically we've gotten a lot of comments from people asking about cases. So what I'm doing is I'm writing a third book, which is basically a collection of short stories. And um, some of the stuff, you know, I, I'm, I'm redacted the names and changed the names and the places just to protect people's privacy and stuff like that. But what it's going to be, it's going to be the well, we'll see how it goes. I'll write a second one if that one does well, but it'll probably be about 25, 30 chapters. And each chapter will be, you know, a story or a narrative like here's what happened. Here's how it happened. And, and my goal is to, to make sure that all the high strangeness and the creepiness and the weirdness of it is totally conveyed in the, in the book. And, and I think that'll be interesting. A lot of people like to read those kind of stories and it'll be fun writing it too. So, but yeah, if you go on Amazon and also on my website, it's, it's langpublication.com. If you go on my website, there's links to buy the books. There's more information about my bio and, and some of the other books that we're getting ready to do too. And what we do, we basically publish books for, you know, um, my, my role, my business is we publish books we, for people that want to self-publish. So they basically send me a manuscript. We put it all together, format it, get it on Amazon for them. And then, you know, they collect the royalties and all that. That's what we do. Interesting. Now, you mentioned in one of your books, you go through the steps of how you think disclosure is going to happen. Obviously, it seems like they're already taking the first steps towards that. With how people have reacted to, to COVID, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of craziness that happened over the past few years. Do you think that the world is really ready to accept that uh, there might be all this stuff legitimately going on and we might not be the uh, highest power in the universe? Well, exactly. And, and that's really where I was going. The second book, the last couple of chapters is, is that's what I'm dealing with. And, and the way I try to relate that is, is if you remember back and I, and I, I, I researched it and I, there's a little bit of information about it, but back in, in like 1938, Orson Welles did this, this, this radio show and, and it was a spoof, but they basically started out the radio show and then they kept breaking in with bulletins, how this UFO had landed in New Jersey. And then, you know, then another bullet would come on. Oh, they're, they're landing all over the country and the military can't do anything about it. And, 
you know, and, and this radio show is going on and on. And the, in the, in the announcer, he's, he's sitting there pretending like he's choking on poison gas because they're landing in New York and all this stuff. And, and eventually the, the, actually what happened was it caused such a panic that the, like the police stations, their phones are blowing up. People are calling the police stations. People are literally leaving their homes, jumping in their cars and trying to get out of town. And there were these like massive traffic jams and people driving crazy and, um, the, the police were like overwhelmed. It was like a nightmare. And, and they got to the point where they went to the radio station, which I didn't know at the time until I researched, but the police actually went to the radio station, try to get them to stop the, the radio show bec- because there was such mayhem going on. People are like in New York, we're trying to get out of town and out of New Jersey. It was like insane. And, and so my point in, in bringing that up is I, I don't think that the people that are in control of this information are going to be able to be dumb enough to make that mistake again. So what I think they're doing is they're going to give it to you a little bit at a time. And it's kind of like a, a process of educating people. First, we come out and we say, here's some pictures of these UFOs. Here's these fighter jet pilots pictures. And these are real. We don't know where they come from, but we know they're real. And we, we think they might be a threat because they're buzzing around our military bases in, their, in, in our uh, classified airspace. And, and they don't have our permission because there are areas where you've got classified airspace and all that fly in there and they just do whatever they want. And they obviously don't contact the control tower and let them know they're coming through. And, and that the military doesn't like that. And um, understandably. So so the first phase is to just, OK, this is real. The, that report that came out in my book, I analyzed it page by page, eight page, nine pages. And they don't say they don't come out and even admit that any of this could be extraterrestrial. You know, it's weather balloons, swamp gas, all that kind of stuff. But they do say it's real and it's high technology and that their pilots, that, that technology that's way advanced from from our aviation. And, and so that's the first step. It's real and it's happening. OK. And then, you know, and, and I said I tried to convey in my book that a lot of people who are seeing this stuff now are thinking this is just starting to happen. In fact, it's it's been going on for 70 years. And so the next thing you're going to have to do is take them up the next step to, to talk a little bit more about the technology and somewhere about halfway up the stairway, we're going to start talking about the possibility that it might come from another planet and that they're intelligently controlled and then work your way up to where at some point that the people are, are, are prepared to deal with the fact that, that we're not alone here and that, you know, we might want to be nice to these guys if, if we have a chance to in, have encounters with them, which I'm sure we will. But it's going to be a, a, a that's my whole point in my book is it's going to be a, dis, a process of disclosure and it's going to take some time to get people acclimated to it. And I talked about I remember President Reagan had done um, when the movie E.T. came out um, that they had a, a done they had done a premiere at the White House, you know, where the party and everybody's watching the movie and and Reagan turns around and there's a couple people standing around. He goes, you know, there's only six people in this room that realize how true this is. And that's pretty well documented. But, um, you know, the, the, the movie, a lot of people have us watched the movie, uh, close encounters of the third kind. It came out in 1980. And now there's, there's documentary and evidence indicating that that actually happened at an air force base. And, um, you know, a lot of the information that, um, they conveyed in that movie, I had, I watched it when it came out and then I recently watched it again. And I was like amazed. There's so much detail in that movie that I've seen over the years in my research that, you know, they really put a lot of information into that, that, you know, it, it obviously went over my head the first time, but I can see that, that there's a lot of that stuff in there. That's, that's pretty, pretty cool and interesting. What is your thoughts on the cattle mutilation and other animal mutilation phenomena? That's one of the phenomena that, that has been observed at Skinwalker Ranch, but obviously yeah. all over the world, not just in the US. It's also happened in Canada, where basically it looks like these animals have had the blood sucked out of them with no trace of blood and have had their eyes cut out and skin around the jaw lines cut out using uh, surgical instruments with, with not much evidence being left as to what, what this, what's happened. Um, the, and, and I should, I probably shouldn't say this on air, but there also, there's been several cases where that's happened with humans too. 
Uh, I, I have some pictures. I've seen some pictures. I mean, it's pretty gruesome. The Brazilian yeah. one is the only one I've heard about. But as, as you said, uh, there there's probably others out there you would may have seen there's in your research. Female in France like that too, re fairly recently. But um, for the most part, that stuff never hits the public domain. I don't know if it's really happening that much and they're keeping it quiet because obviously that would be very dangerous information and people get real upset and panicked about that. But the cattle mutilations, um, they obviously do occur. And, um, you know, some, some researchers think that there's some military activity in that. And, and I really don't know for sure, but a lot of researchers think that there's some, some that that's being, some of that's being done by, 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 you know, terrestrial military operations, but, but it's, it's nasty business. Um, I know guys that, that, that have done that kind of work in, in, you know, um, I, there's no way I'm going down there at a hundred degrees and dig through an animal's carcass that's been sitting out in the sun for two weeks. You know, it's just like that, that's nasty business, tough, tough work. And it seems like at least in that Brazilian reservoir case and many of the animal mutilation cases that the researchers have found that these things often will die from pain. It seems like they haven't actually been killed before these procedures happen. Yeah. Again, I'm not an expert on mutilations, but I, I, I know that's in the research. I've heard that and seen it, you know, written creepy. Now, one of the researchers that, do, that does say that uh, this has actually been caused by our own military and other military. Well, actually, Stephen Greer believes that it's been the U.S. military doing them all over the world, which I find hard to believe. And that uh, some abductions have also been caused by our own military using deformed humans and, and little people and so forth. Um, What's your opinion on that? You mentioned that you're not an expert. Well, the, um, you, you know, I mean, if you just take a look at it, okay. So, so guys got a farm and there's, there's a, a cow out there. And so obviously they take it somewhere to do it. Cause a lot of times they end up being dropped and there's evidence where they hit the ground, you know, but, um, you would think that if they were going to do something like that, rather than terrorize people, they would just take the cow, do whatever they want to them and drop them out in the oceans. You know, if you have, if you have, you know, if you have the capability to fly like they do, just take them out and drop them in the ocean somewhere where it wouldn't cause so much of a, 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 a fiasco, but they seem to make sure they bring them back to the place where they originated from. And then that of course gets the farmers all stirred up even more than the cow just disappearing, you know, because if the cow disappeared, you might think somebody stole it, rustled it or something like that. But when you find half of it, gets dropped out back in the field it's pretty 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 painful and very creepy and if it was the military they could just go to a slaughterhouse and i'm sure buy cattle and take them to a military facility and perform no, those no. and throw out the, the garbage after the leftovers well and the only thing that the 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 the, the uh, conventional thinking on that is that they're doing some kind of like environmental study like you know, with the long-term effects of radiation or some, some, that, that kind of thing might be the, the reason that they're doing that. It doesn't, it doesn't, like I say, I'm not an expert in it. I've never done one. Uh, thank God. Um, but I know people that have done them and, and talked to them about it and how they do it and all that kind of thing. But I'm, I don't, I don't know. And i and some of the time these things are dropped on their back with their feet up in the air. So for the people that claim that these are, uh, satanists or whatever uh, it'd be very difficult for them to perform these type of surgeries without access to very expensive equipment yeah most of the stuff that you know the the research that i've seen is you can see they're they're cut it's like cut with a laser or something and then you know you said the blood's drained and all that kind of stuff it's very weird this is a good question from Pubert. Uh, what do you think about ufologists call, calling other ufologists disinformation agents? How does the average person figure who to believe and who not? Now, I've even been called a disinformation agent, and I've interviewed Nick Pope, uh, the former head of the, the British uh, UFO uh, yeah, I know. desk. And there's so many comments every day on his videos 
Nick Pope is a disinformation agent. So what are your thoughts on Pubert's question there? Well, I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but, you know, sometimes ufology is like if you ever look in an alligator pit, you know, and they're all like, you throw a stake in there and they're all jumping on top of each other trying to get it. So there's, there's a certain amount of that mentality going on. Um, the, and it's always been like that in, in ever since I've been involved in this, there's always been a lot of infighting that occurs between the different researchers, you know, the, the, you know, I'm sure tomorrow somebody will be, tr you know, trashing my book, but I've been doing it long enough. I don't care anymore. Um, but um, I think part of it has to do with if you look at how how this different disinformation works. Um, no matter you know, in in doing my research for the books, you run across certain re recurring themes. And in general, I would say that, you know, when you talk like to the astronauts and some of the stuff that they've seen on the moon and they'll all tell you the CIA is the one covering it up, you know, and some of these researchers that that um, that I met that like were worked in the FAA and, you know, they'll tell you it was CIA people come and took the, pic the tapes and said, don't ever talk about this again. So the CIA has had a very strong hand in disrupting a lot of this stuff. And, and, and I think some of them, they they infiltrate groups and um they i mean guys that have been out there speaking i've had them disrupt my meetings before and you know the, the I, I vividly remember up in washington I, I got into it with this guy and before i got up one of my friends who was a government employee said he wrote cia on the piece of paper and pointed at the guy and and i'd seen this guy around before and basically it was when i was running the, the bigelow project and they asked me to speak and he just kept this up. You know, he finally, he just kept dis disrupting me. He asked me the same question over five times. And, um, that was his job, you know, and those people, uh, they're government agents. They're extremely well paid. You work for the CIA, you make three, $400,000 a year. And I'm doing this for free, driving up there to give a lecture, you know, burning my own gas and not getting paid for it. And, and there's this guy that's going to try to trash my, my, my event. But, I think that a lot of them have infiltrated these groups and, and a lot of them I think are responsible for some of the, you know, like the, the infighting that's, that's going on. If, if that, that's just my opinion, but I'm pretty sure that, you know, a lot of that is just, just people that are just, they're just, their job is to disrupt things and they do it. Anytime you hear anybody start up about conspiracy theory, they're probably CIA. Yeah, one thing I have found as I've done more of these interviews and put more videos out is there is a lot of infighting and politics in the UFO community. Exactly. Yeah, and it, and it's um, um, the I I think well, I don't know if I want to go or not. Okay, what the hell? Um, here's the deal: is a lot of these organizations, um, like for example with Mufon. Um, the most important thing, and I've conveyed this in my book, um, it's, a, it's a good organization. I learned a lot doing it, and there's a lot of people that use their systems and learn a lot, and, and they do a lot of great investigative work. But I think behind the scenes is they have built this incredible database. It's called CMS. But basically, you know, for 30-some, Project Blue Book ends, and MUFON starts at the exact same time. In the whole time that I was involved with them, no one could ever explain where the money came from to build this build this server that runs their 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 database, and and their servers fast and slow down. So it's a big, huge, powerful, well maintained server somewhere, but nobody could ever explain who paid for it or who was maintaining it. And um, I think that a lot of that the the most important thing to them is to get these people to propel these organizations because the, the most important thing is when when people report sightings so right now if, if you if, if you go out and you're driving home tonight and you see you know flying saucer or a triangle comes right over your car and scares the hell out of you when you get home and you you go report a ufo boom mufon's going to come up and you're going to go in there and they, like i said it's going to give you a you know, a, a report form. It's going to ask you all kinds of questions about what happened, how it happened. And you'll think it's really, 
it's it's pretty impressive because they're going to ask you a lot of questions about things you felt that you didn't think about it when, when it was happening. Okay. And it's, it's really well done, extremely well done. And, and, and you're going to file that report. And that's really the backbone of that organization. That's what they're there for, you know? And so the, the powers to be that are running that, it seems like they turn people over all the time. And the reason is I think they don't really care because the, the database is what they're trying to keep going. And, and, in all fairness to them, I mean, it's a, it's a hell of a system and it really works. And, you know, if you're, a, 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 if you're an investigator and you're in, in MUFON, you're going to get to see a lot of really cool stuff and a lot of interesting stuff, and you're going to learn a lot of stuff. And so it, it's worth it. But, you know, there's probably a back door there where somebody's taking advantage of that information as well. But I think a lot of that kind of caused some of the infighting like that is like, it seems like when people are there for a long time, they seem to turn over, you know, there, there was a, a wave right when I was, involved with the star team like there's probably 20 of us that just got kicked out of MUFON all at the same time you know the state directors and stuff like that they were cleaning the house and then they put people in there that you know weren't experienced and and um you know uh as long as they keep that database going that's that's you know if that's blasphemy so be it but that's i think a lot of what what they're doing Brett is wondering if you could elaborate any more on the human mutilations that you're aware of well, again, it's, it's, it's very rare. And, and from time to time, people sometimes will send you information, which, which I, I had received some pictures that, um, it was, a a, a, a female in, in, I think it was France and, um, it, it really gruesome. And, um, I, I really didn't want, I, I really didn't have any firsthand information on it other than the photo and the person that sent it to me. So I didn't investigate the case or anything. So I'm not going to just randomly talk about something unless I know what I'm talking about. In this case, I, I really don't. Other than the fact it's just pretty horrible. And it's also something that, you know, it, I couldn't really authenticate it either. So to put it out in the public domain like that without knowing for sure if it's real or something, I really don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to uh, dance to that romance. And, 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 um, it, 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 and it, it, it will do no public good. You know, if it is real, scare the hell out of people if they see that. And, and and that's not, you know, what we want. Now, you mentioned earlier about the the various species of, of aliens. How did you become aware of this? And could you talk a little bit more about the ones, for instance, you mentioned the greys and you said there's others that, according to reports, look more like us and you couldn't really tell whether or not they're not from here or not. But as far as you're aware, could you tell us a little bit about some of the different species that may exist and how you've become aware of, of these various species? Sure. Um, first of all, I've not had any personal contact with any of these guys. Okay. But what I have done is I've interviewed a lot of people over the years that have. You know, people that have had close encounters, had induction experiences, and I've interviewed a bunch of them. And so what I know about different species is based on what these people told me and how I conceptualize what they said. So you interview someone and they say that they were taken to a ship and that they were taken by these little guys that are like four feet tall with big heads. We call them grays. And when they got in the ship, there was also a humanoid looking person a big guy, maybe six two, something like that. Totally normal looking guy that if you passed him on the street, you never think twice about it was also in there. But the only thing I know about different life forms is what other people have told me. And there's obviously a variety of them, you know, anything from humanoid looking, the grays, there's another group, um, they call the guardians and they look like grays, but they're like six feet tall. Um, you hear that when you hear there, there's something about that guardian thing. That's very interesting. I'm not sure I have it all figured out yet, but if you hear somebody talk about guardian, pay attention. There's something there to learn, I think. Um, and so, yeah, that's it. There's different species and also the different types of vehicles too. It's pretty dramatic. Yeah. The I interesting thing about the vehicles the, the is it's. Box. Well, the, 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 the different types of vehicles, you know, you've got these saucers that were real common back in the sixties and seventies. And then, um, you know, now a lot of the, the stuff is like triangle shaped. And honestly, I think some of the triangle stuff is, um, is, um, experimental military stuff could be, 
And then you have the other side of this where you have these huge, huge vehicles that are like, if you remember back the, the Phoenix lights case, you know, back in, um, um, you know, that this thing came over Phoenix and in like thousands of people saw it. And, um, the, the, the governor at the time, Simonson, um, you know, they put a press conference out and they had some guy come out with this stupid alien suit on and, you know, they were trying to make fun of it. And, um, you know, later on the interview that he did after he wasn't governor anymore is like amazing because he's basically telling us that, you know, when, when that happened, it scared the crap out of them because they didn't know what to do. This huge, he said he went out and viewed it and it was a boomerang shaped thing with lights on it. And, and, and the wingspan was like more than a mile across. That's how big it was. And it came right over, hovered over Phoenix. He said, we didn't, we didn't know what to do. And he said, then the air force came out later that night and started dropping flares. So they could say, well, it was just air, you know, to try to cover it up. And then he said, right at the, in time for the 11 o'clock news to pick it up, the air force buzzed over and dropped a bunch of flares, um, to try to cover it. You know, this is the governor telling you what was really going on behind the scenes. So they're just some amazing, you know, some of the things that people see are, are huge. You know, I, I interviewed a guy one time and, um, I'm quite sure he's telling me the truth. I knew him. And, um, he said that he was in, in, and I think I wrote about it. I did write about it in the book. Um, and, and basically he, he was working, he was an intelligence officer. He was in the military. When I met him, he was a bank officer and real reliable, honest, no nonsense type person. And he said, you know, they took him out one night. They rousted everybody up, did general alarm quarter at one or two o'clock in the morning and, and took everybody out to a beach somewhere. And so he goes, we're all standing around the beach. We have no idea why. And he goes, you know, back then you're not going to ar argue with your commanding officer. You're just going to get up and go, you know? So we're standing on this beach and all of a sudden this huge thing starts coming down. He said, it came down and it was maybe a couple thousand feet over us. He said, you couldn't see the stars anymore. It covered the whole sky up. And I've said, well, well define huge for me. What do you mean by huge? And he goes, it was the size of a small strip mall shopping center. I was like, whoa, you know, so there's some some wild stuff out there now i've heard that some of the triangle ones seem to be almost surveying land uh have you have you heard anything like the tic tacs uh the difference between the various there you mentioned there is the classic saucer the more tic tac looking ones the triangle ones then like the massive motherships the size of a shopping mall but any any idea like on the difference uh that some of these craft might be are they just from different worlds possibly or different areas of the galaxy or is there actual purposeful differences to these craft well again it's it's a matter of um you know i think there's there's the the reason I think there's different societies is because there's different entities involved and there's different craft types. And I think, you know, the bottom line is they all probably have their, their different agendas too. Um, the triangle shape, the, 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 the more current triangle shape ones, I think some of those could be experimental military aircraft, but there's also some, what were extraterrestrial crafts that were, um, you know, that, that, that we're seeing. And I think they've done some back engineering with some of those things too. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, a, a lot of, um, there's a lot of orbs that, that happen to into the, a lot of these reports and these orbs are, you know, it, people describe them like it looks like a glass ball, the side, and it, it, it looks like a glass ball with fire burning in it, kind of an orangish glowing kind of thing. And they're intelligently controlled. And some of them can be fairly large and some of them can be, you know, like the size of a basketball or football or a, a softball, soccer ball. Like most of them describe that size of soccer ball and that they zoom around and, you know, there's been cases where I'm writing one right now about the lady, you know, she's out, she gets out of her car and this thing comes, it was in a cornfield. She noticed it, it comes zooming across and stops like three feet in front of her face, scares, scares the hell out of her. And her face was all sunburned, you know, from it. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of orbs and, and a lot of researchers, I think, believe that the orbs are, you know, like there's a mothership way up there somewhere and the orbs like a probe, you know, or a drone that comes down and, you know, it's whatever it's doing, it's checking you out or checking something out or, you know, 
and and who knows what you know what they're looking at they they're um remember we're in this this um we're in this um third dimensional you know time space reality but at the same time there's other dimensional realities that exist simultaneously in the, in the same space so there could be things going on around us in our environment that we don't even know about because because they're out of our dimensional reality but somebody's very concerned about them for some reason but i i think most of the most of the you know most of what i've seen or 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 in reports and read about is that the nuclear situation is probably the the prime control that's what they're most worried about what would you uh what's your opinion on the men in black mo is asking do they actually exist well they actually did exist and um in my first book you know i started doing this research back in like the late 80s and early 90s and um i wrote in, in the first book i wrote about a situation where we got involved in a case that was at a uh it was an nsa base that had been closed down is in Venn hill and there was this this ufo abduction that occurred allegedly occurred there and so me and a team of guys went up there to interview them and look for trace evidence and magnetic signatures and all that stuff you know typical investigation wrote a really nice report about it as a matter of fact i got an award from mufon for the superior investigation for that year's you know it's the plaque i still have it while i'm gone um my wife at the time was uh, at home and we lived in a gated community and 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 it's outside of charlottesville so you can't get in there unless you your car has a, a thing on it to open the gates or somebody invites you and then the police have to let you in so anyway, I'm at this working on this case. She's at home with the dog. We have this big husky. He's like a 90 pound husky. Look Malamute. Looks like a wolf. And um, we had a, a, a run in the backyard that came off our deck. So basically you go to the back deck, open the door to the deck and hook his collar on it. And then he could run around the backyard. So he's out there while I'm at this thing and he's getting all anxious and wound up and, 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 and scratching at the door. And so she goes and lets him out. And when she did, he ran to the end of his lead. He's up on his back legs and he's barking. And, and she looks and there's a guy down in the woods with a walkie talkie watching him. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I know. And then we, we did a little, and again, we went around and, and I've got a picture of it. There was a surveillance van at the, at the, at the pub, at the golf course that apparently after they were done watching me, they went get something to eat. But, um, the, it, it, it definitely happened. They were definitely people watching you back then. Now, um, they don't have to do that anymore because, you know, we're in the age of cell phones and stuff like that. I don't, I don't, we don't have to follow anybody. You, I can look at, first of all, you're going to file your report on their case management system. So I'll read everything that you put in there about it if I want to. And I can check your cell phone and see where you're going, who you're talking to, who you're texting and all that kind of stuff. So there's no reason to follow anybody around anymore because because they can use your phone and your computer system to figure out what you're doing where you're doing who you're talking to and what you're talking about all that kind of stuff so i don't think that's happening anymore but i clearly think that back in the day there were people that um and it was a combination of because i know for a fact i've talked to some of these old guys that were government agents back then and he said they did you know they wore suits and they go around and interview somebody and try to scare the hell out of them and take their film and you know get them to shut up about whatever they talked about and told them not to worry about it, swamp gas and all that stuff but then there's also the men in black where these guys are like creepy pale they're kind of pale and like automated almost looking and and i've reviewed and i've interviewed several people that had encounters with them they're just like guys that are like really weird and um you know there was some some of the things like i'm trying to remember but like some of the things the person would talk about they didn't seem to know what he was talking like the guy said something about eating spaghetti and the guy didn't he's like mm, you know it didn't compute but anyway um you know yeah there there were i don't know that's happening anymore and they always drove black crown victorias that was the the you know the crown victoria was the the prototype for all the police cars they had the big police interception you know the really powerful police interceptor engines in them and 
and all that kind of stuff. But all the government agents drove Crown Victorias back then too. So I don't know. Big Tings is wondering, what do you think about the legitimacy of Bob Lazar? Oh, I think he's for real. There's no question. I mean, um, the, the, he is, that's all there's to it. You know, I think, think that, um, some of these guys, um, um, uh, Lear and, um, um, George Knapp have interviewed him. I mean, he's, he's for real. Yeah. And, you know, of course, once he started talking about that, all of a sudden, you know, his whole education gets erased and his credentials get erased and typical crap. But yeah, I think he, I always did think he was for real. And he's recently, I haven't been paying a lot of attention, but he's recently come out now on some shows and stuff and been interviewed again. But yeah, I think he's real. Now I've interviewed Travis Walton. Uh, that's probably one of the the most publicized cases because they did the Hollywood movie about his abduction experience. Uh, he was a very unusual man in my dealings with him. But uh, it certainly seems like he experienced something because he he becomes very uh, shaken when talking about it. But I'm curious what your thoughts are on his situation. You mean on Travis? Oh, I know Travis well. I've been to a dozen conferences where I've, I've met him and talked to him. We've been in, at dinners together, you know, with a group of people. I, yeah, I, I know him pretty well. I mean, I've talked to him a number of times. Um, I think he's totally... I think he's, you know, I mean, I think his story is real good. It's real. I think I believe it, you know, and I'm not usually going to say I believe somebody or not believe him, but, um, the, the, the thing that if, 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 when you're looking at Travis, um, Jen Stein did this documentary about, about that case. It was like 20 years or later or whatever, but basically what they did is they went back and interviewed all these people that were involved in the original case, the sheriff, you know, that was, that, that was in the movie and, and, and all the other people involved and um, the investigators and interviewed them all. And they're basically, it's a pretty good document. They're basically telling the same story that, that they said the first time around in the movie. So that sort of pretty much authenticates it for me as far as that goes, but the documentary she's got out, is really good. Interesting. Travis is a good guy. Now, what is your uh, opinion on these alien implants that have allegedly been found with some abductees? Okay, let me think the guy's name that was doing the research. It was Roger. Um, oh, crap. Give me a minute. I'll, I'll remember the name, but he was a doctor. And I met him at a couple of conferences. And um, basically what they were doing is um, the pe people that had abduction experiences they do x-ray and find what looked like a kernel of corn or like a kernel of rice up inside somebody's sinus cavity somewhere up in here, something like that. There's other places like taking them out of people's legs and, and that kind of thing. And there are, in, there are some kind of an implant. Um, and, and he did that research and um, they, they took them out. And the weird part about it is when they take them out, they sort of like melt or something. They, they, kind of self-destruct it's really weird but they worked on um they pick up the electrical energy in the body which powered them and and you know god only knows what they were doing to that person or what kind of I I information that they were you know um wh whatever whatever kind of information they were kind of trying to um get from them or give them or i don't know but but yeah there there was some pretty interesting stuff that was done with that so you think it's just kind of like tracking as if we would track a, an animal? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing you got to remember is when you look at these, you, when you look at these abduction cases, you interview some of these people. And if you start digging into it, you'll find out that some of their family members had the same problem. You know, a woman that's been abducted three or four times. And then you find out her grandmother has been abducted too. Her grandmother talked about these experiences that, Back then, they were they didn't even have a clue what was going on to what was happening to them, but they knew that these these weird, creepy things were getting a hold of them. And I think that for for whatever reason, the abduction research, whatever direction it takes you, I think that um, part of that is um, part of that is it has something to do with 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 uh, the the family history. In other words, if they abducted your grandmother and abducted your mother, they're probably going to come and get you someday too. And they've got a way to figure out and track those people. 
which I, I, I don't have a clue how, but I'm just saying that some of the research indicates that, that people's, uh, you know, a woman's mother or grandmother had also had abduction experiences. Marion would like to know what you know about the alleged reptilian species of aliens. Not, not much. I'm not, um, other than, um, you know, drawings and stuff people have made, I've really not encountered that much with reptilians. What are your thoughts on, uh, I mean, I'm not going to talk about the alleged uh, takeover of Antarctica that, that helped uh, allegedly uh, with World War II, but like there is lots of reports related to UFO activity over Antarctica and supposed bases in, uh, in Antarctica hidden. What are your thoughts on that? There's something going on there. You know, obviously I've never been there and, and it's not somewhere where you can just easily go. Um, but research indicates that there's, there's a lot of, of activity down there and there's a lot of stuff that's going on or has gone on down there. The public doesn't have a clue about. Have you heard of Charles Hall and his stories about these tall white species of aliens and his claim that he worked on a military base as a weather guy? where supposedly these tall white species of aliens had had a base within another military base don't i don't the the name no i've not crossed paths with him or, or no i don't i don't know that about that for for people that maybe aren't that familiar with with ufos activity and want to learn more obviously there's your books which we put the links to in the description, but is there any cases that stand out to you that you feel are more credible than others if people want to look them up? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, and, um, the, there's an unbelievable amount of information out there. If you look for it, you know, um, if you just go on, go to Amazon and Google UFOs, you'll, you'll find book after book after book about it, you know, and, um, the, 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 the not only the, the, the types of cases that happen, but also, you know, different locations. And, um, there's, there's just a, a unbelievable amount of stuff that's out there, you know, and I think, um, you're probably going to see more of it now because the way things are, you know, with this whole disclosure thing that's starting to open up, I think you're going to see more and more information about it. But there's just so many cases. It's like, you know. Are any of your you, books available for audio download through any of these audio book sites? You know, I think my books, um, I think my books, if, if you get the Kindle version of the book, I think you can listen to that on Kindle. I'm all, I'm not positive, but I think you can. You know how if you if you have some books in Kindle, you can just click it and it'll read it to you. I think it it won't re be me reading it to you, but it's just like a um you know digital voice reading it to you. I think some Kindles you can do that. I think, but I'm not sure. Don't hold me to that because I'm not sure. I will have to go look into it now that you asked me. Winding it down here, Freedom Man wants to know your opinion on the Battle of Los Angeles. Well, I'm not, um, I'm not a researcher in the sense that like people say, well, what about that historic case that happened in 1945? And I'm like, I haven't a clue, you know, um, I don't research historical stuff that much. And most of the work that I've done is just basically face to face work with individuals and, and experiencers or, you know, working on cases and current cases and technology like that. So, you know, I, I know there's a lot of stuff out there about that. And I really haven't studied it that much because, because I just don't, I don't have time, you know, I'm, I'm working on current things, but um, some of the historical cases, I, I, I didn't need that for any of my books. I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have researched it, but um, I know there's, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about it and there's a lot of good information about it. What was your favorite investigation to work on of, of all the investigations you've done? Hmm. Wow, that's a hard question because I've done some. Uh, 
I've been a lot, I've done a lot of stuff. Uh, some of the, 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 the early on, I would say some of the, the, uh, abduction cases I worked on were, were, were really fascinating. Um, one of the cases I, I, I'll tell you that, uh, we did, um, when, when I was working on the, the, the Bigelow project, the Bass project, we did a case that, that happened up in Port Jarvis, New York. And basically, um, what happened is that this guy was, um, in the medical field, he's driving home around Christmas time. He's listening to Christmas music in his new car in Mitsubishi. And, um, as he's, he's, he's winding out, it was a country road on the way home, you know, and he's winding through the country and every time he comes up the top of the hill, he notices a light up there and he gets down and pretty soon he goes up and the light's getting closer and this goes on for a while. And pretty soon the light's getting real close, you know? And so at some point he sees this really big light right out up, up in the air, but, but in, getting closer to him. So he pulls his car over just out of curiosity to just try to figure out what the hell it is, you know, and he's looking at it and, um, uh, the thing gets, gets real close to him and we drew drawings of it. And basically it went right, uh, it, it hovered over his car and he couldn't see what it looked like. All he could see was the bottom of it. And it, it was like kind of it, he characterized it like as a big, almost like a fan blade that was rotating, you know, like an, a rectangular shaped thing that was rotating and it had multicolored lights on it. So when the thing gets right over his car, all of a sudden, bam, everything shuts off. The headlights go out, the dash lights go out, the music stops playing, his cell phone is dead, and he's sitting in his car in the dark, and this thing's hovering over him. And up till then, you know, initially he was curious, and now he's starting to get scared. He's terrified. He's like, I don't, I remember him saying that, like, I didn't know what to do, whether I get out of the car and run or stay in a car. And the answer is always stay in a car. Um, but, um, the, he actually, he still had his seatbelt on. He opens the car door. He looks up like that. And when he looks up, boom, it disappeared. And when it disappeared, I said, did it fly away or what? He goes, I don't know. I just, it, I, my car, the, the car was running again. And he said, I just put the car in gear and got the hell out of there. I stepped on the gas and got the hell out of there. I don't know what, what happened to it. it scared him. It scared him really bad. But, um, the thing is, is it, it, it turned his car off, stopped the car. And then when it left, the car started running again. And, and it would, that's, that's, that's a really good close encounter case. Well, we flew up there, sent investigator up there and he did the preliminary investigation. He told me when he got there, like the day after it happened and he walked up to the car, he said, I put my hand out and like 10, 11 inches away from the car, you could feel the static cling coming off it. The car was charged. You know, like if you open a cleaner bag with a wolf, wolf sweater in it or something like that, that static snappy stuff. And he's, you could feel it like eight, 10 inches away from the car with your hand. And of course we did, we did a lot of like, um, instrument readings and the car had a huge magnetic field around it, which sort of validated the guy's story because something, you know, something happened to make that car get charged like that. And it was just, it was really a fascinating case. We put a lot of time in it. I went back three weeks later. It still had a pretty good field around it. And, um, um, you know, it was just like, it was one of those cases where you had a really interesting story, but you had a lot of physical evidence to back it up. It's one of the best I've worked on. I wasn't going to ask you this, but uh, since you bring it up uh, where you say the answer is, do, you, do I get out of the car and run or stay in the car? Because you've talked to so many alleged abductees, if any of us somehow, for whatever reason, end up in some type of situation where an abduction might occur, what I'll would be you, your advice? I'll give you some advice, and it's in my book, too. Basically, um, the thing is that, first of all, um, do not ever walk under a UFO that's hovering over you because the, 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 they work on an electrogravitic field that is kind of like microwave. If you walk under that thing, it'd be like sticking your hand in a microwave oven. You can imagine the tissue damage it can do. And people that have gotten out of their cars have been, you know, ended up getting cancer and stuff like that from it. So the metal in your car will protect you a little bit from it. It's better than if you get out of the car, that's a really bad thing to do. Don't do it. Stay in the car. Um, and, 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 and do your best to stay from not getting underneath it. Um, also 
if you encounter one of these crafts that's on the ground and it's still powered up, the metallic skin from that thing puts out an ultraviolet radiation that'll give you a really wicked sunburn on your skin. It's like sunburn. And it also, there have been cases where there's some, there's radiation that comes off of them. It's like in the x-ray spectrum that can cause radiation sickness and a lot of very serious health complications. So don't go up and walk up and try to touch it. Don't walk under it. And you want to keep some serious distance away from it. And also there's a number of these cases where, you know, I've encountered where people have that, you know, million candle power, candle power spotlight that they use for, you know, spotlight hunting deer at night, you know, out in the country, the guy's got them in their pickup truck. Don't ever point one of them things at the craft because it always ends up disastrously if you do. Um, and it also will attract the attention of it too. So basically don't point any kind of high intensity lights at them and don't get underneath them and don't touch them or get close to them. Not to mention that, you know, if, if you do get close enough to them where they're aware you're there, they, they can, you know, they can use some kind of energy field to pretty much traumatize you where you, you they can get a hold of, you know, it'll, it'll kind of put you in shock or something. You can't get away from them. So that's, does that help? I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, well, we've heard even in the Travis Walton story, when he approached the craft, it yeah. shot him back like a lightning bolt. And of course, there's that famous one from Manitoba, Canada, here in Canada, where, as you mentioned, the guy did get radiation on him um, and was actually medically treated for it uh, when, he, when he found, uh, I think it was called the Falcon Lake UFO case here in Manitoba. Well, I think um, Travis Travis told me that he thought that the reason they took him, after, he walked up underneath it and got zapped. And he thinks that they, they took him in there to save his life. They might He might have had like a cardiac arrest or something like that. And he thinks that they took him in there to revive him and, and, and give him medical treatment. Stan is wondering if there is a continent that has the most UFO sightings that you're aware of. I don't, I don't know. Um, I think that, that the phenomena is pretty well worldwide and it's just a matter of, of who's, um, who's reporting it and, and not only who's reporting it, but what, what country you're in, you know, um, it, like in South America, Mexico, they're real open to this stuff. And, you know, Jaime Massad and some of those people just like, you know, they're on TV all the time showing you videos and pictures of this stuff because their media there is interested in it and they're not like censored in any way. But if you go into other parts of the world where they're real, their governments are real tight, they're not going to let you see any of that stuff. So I think it has more to do with as far as, I think they're probably gl globe. They're probably all, all over the world and it's just a matter of who's reporting and who's seeing them. But I don't think that there's any particular, um, I don't think there's any particular country or anything that attracts mm -hmm. their attention more so than, um, you'd be more inclined to see them around like nuclear weapon storage areas or missile silo places like that. I think there's that, that you could be sure that they're going to be around there once in a while. There's a, a viewer here that mentions about what you were talking earlier, the uh, the UFO drawings being around since seemingly the beginning of time, because they've been around so long, do you do you ever expect that they're going to show themselves more? Or of course, like if we had a Phoenix Lights incident today, it'd be recover, it'd be uh, recorded so well that it wouldn't be as easily denied, but. There, there is, of course, obviously a new species could come and find us that's more, uh, more open to revealing itself or more or have more negative intentions. But basically, I'm just wondering, do you think they're going to reveal themselves more in, let's say, the next 50 to 100 years? Or is it just going to be more of the same with us maybe finding out more um, due to, due our, to our technologies? Well, I don't think that 
as far as them revealing themselves to us, I don't think that's the problem. I think the government doesn't want us to know about them and they go out of their way to make sure that, you know, that, 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 that we don't have any more contact with them than they, they can possibly manage. Okay. The, the, the long, the short version is, is, you know, we look at recorded history. We're going to say, okay, let's go back 6,000 years to Sumerian time. So most of the, the, the history books and what's taught in schools is our human history is like 6,000 years old, which is, obviously not true. The pyramids are probably 12, 15,000 years old. And, and somebody was around that built them. And, and I think if you look back, there's probably been, um, there's been humans, and I don't mean people that evolved from apes and monkeys, but cognizant human beings on this planet for 100,000 years. You know, and it's just, we, we, you know, we're probably some of the archaeology and some of the studies that are being done that, you know, it, 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 clearly I think that's what, what what's happened now what what contact they've had with alien species you know I'm not, I'm not even dumb enough to say what I think about that on air but uh I think that you know they've been around a long time do you think that uh these could have been what people uh, interpreted as gods in the earlier days oh I'm sure that there was some of that going on yeah yeah if these alien species came down and, and, um, I'm sure these people would be, um, quite, quite, um, subservient to them based on the kind of technology they have and stuff, you know? Yeah, sure. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. Your latest book, the link is in the description, UFO investigation, Thanks. the age of disclosure. Um, anyone, uh, can just follow the links in the description to his other books. I appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. It was very informative. Maybe in the future we could have you on again, but Absolutely. I'll let you, uh, I'll let you close this off with whatever you want to say to the viewers. Oh, uh, well, I just thank you guys for taking the time to watch, watch the show. And, um, I appreciate the questions. And, um, again, we're coming, we're coming out with another book that's going to be about a lot of these cases. Some of them I've talked about, which, uh, it, it seems like most of the comments we get people like, boy, I wish you had more information about cases and stuff like that. So we're working on one right now for the, the, the third one that's coming out and it'll be part of the series. So you'll see it pop up when it does, but I enjoyed talking to you guys. This was a real nice, um, interview format and love to do it again sometime soon. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe.